Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the CAF Disaster Preparedness Program's COVID Weekly Roundup. Normally, Jason is here to host you, so you're definitely not on the wrong webinar. Um, I will be your host today. My name is Deanne Walters, and I'm the Director of Clinical Affairs and Quality Improvement with CAF. The weekly roundup is created to bring to you the updates and guidances that have been issued in the prior week, provide you education to assist in this journey that we're on, and to answer your questions. After taking a look at a couple of announcements, we'll turn our attention to our presenter today, Dr. Kennedy, and her presentation will be on boosting your mental health during a crisis. So hopefully you and maybe even you've referred some of your team members to be on um, to hear um, that great information. So to submit questions today, you want to use your question box it's to the right of your screen. All questions for Dr. Kennedy will be posed during this webinar for whatever time we have. Additional questions to her that we might not have time for, we will um, get back to you on those as well as your questions on other topics that you submit individually. And so that way we can um, keep everything focused on the current presenter's topic. So we're gonna talk about the very first thing that we're gonna um, be looking at, and that is the latest AFL. So the AFL 2060. Um, this provides guidance that transitions the weekly reporting on testing to the, from the district offices to online reporting, and it's the same reporting system that the daily reporting was completed on before. It's supposed to be a very simple toggle from the daily reporting with a button that will pull you over into the weekly reporting on the correct days. Um, it's very specific, so they have a data dictionary that's available to you on kind of your time frames and what you need to report. They are pretty much in alignment with what you were reporting to the district offices before. So if you have any issues with reporting, you want to make sure that you email CDPH those concerns. And also we ask that you copy Jason and or Patty in those concerns that you're sending to CDPH because here at CAF, we're tracking those so that way we can continue to advocate for you and making um, all of this process as simple as we can possibly get it. So that's our first update. Our second update, most of you are aware that CMS and President Trump have made the announcement that point of care testing devices will be sent directly to skilled nursing facilities across the country. So here in California, those counties are LA, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties. So there is a very specific list of facilities that are going to be receiving these. There are about 230 total facilities at this point in time that are gonna be in the first round of disbursement of those devices. Um, just so that you know, if you're on that list, um, CAF has been advised of it, and we will be sending a direct message to inform you that you are one of those on the initial disbursement. Um, but be aware, uh, additional tests are going to be delivered, and we don't know exactly what point in time those will start coming out to other facilities outside of these original ones. Um, but throughout this process, we want to make sure that all of us are prepared. So you want to be sure that you have gone through the process of the CLIA waiver and making sure you have it in place and that it is current. And we're currently advocating with CDPH because we know that these um, antigen tests are not included in the current testing guidance. And so CDPH said they're going to be looking at it, but we want all of us to be prepared for the time that that AFL is updated. So that way we can jump right onto you to using these new devices to help us prevent getting COVID in our facilities. Those are our two updates. So um, I would like to go ahead and give as much time as possible to our presenter. So at this time, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Alexis Kennedy. Um, she's a trauma researcher at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the founder of Compassion Recharge. She is a forensic psychologist who has worked for decades on the issues of child abuse, sexual violence, and human trafficking. Her research and teaching for the past six years has been focused on the cumulative effects of working with victims and people in crisis. She works with first responders, healthcare workers, and others throughout the United States and Canada. So we are really excited, and thanks to Jason and Courtney for making this happen. Um, I will go ahead now, uh, Dr. Kennedy, and turn this over to you. 
Great, thank you. Hopefully I can work advancing the slides. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. Um, as you can guess, based on my research areas of uh, human trafficking and child abuse, it, it probably not a surprise that about six years ago, I started to feel a little bit burnt out and being a researcher thought, well, what is it that allows some people to stay in difficult jobs for a really, really long time and stay healthy, whereas other people um, struggle and burn out? So I've been, because I've done research in a number of areas that most people don't want to talk about, like child abuse and human trafficking, I'm used to trying to find a way to translate sort of our ideas about stress and abuse in difficult times into more sort of practical information. And unfortunately now, a lot of us are going through trauma cumulatively the entire planet with this COVID crisis. So I'm happy to talk a little bit about what I've come to learn about how the brain and the body works when it's under stress. So I'm trying to figure out, do I have the ability to advance yet? There we are. I think that was me, so. <laughs> You do, you, you now have the ability. Perfect, thank you. So if we were meeting in person, um, and I thought this was actually gonna be a webinar, so I got all dressed up, which was a treat to do, but <laughs> you just have my voice today. But if we were in person, I would say, how are you doing? And the normal response that everybody says is, I'm fine. And that's not really true right now. Even if we're fine in terms of, we haven't lost employment, we have a home, our kids are safe, our parents are safe, we're really not fine. So much is happening now. If we're not worried about ourselves, we're worried about our friends and family, we're worried about our communities, we're worried about our country, we're worried about the planet. And it's really quite extraordinary the amount of pressure that we're all under, particularly because the human brain wants to know what's happening, when will this end, what is the end date, what's predictable. And we really don't do well without that predictability. So it's important for us to think about what it is that we're all going through and why we're not reacting to the world around us the way we normally do. Oops, I've lost my ability to go forward. Uh, go ahead and click into the screen. Hmm. There we are. Oh, I went twice. All right, we'll get this going. So with mental health, uh, we just don't talk enough about it as a society, um, as a country. We do talk about physical health, and that's something that when you bring it up, you know, sometimes you'll have coworkers or friends who are on a sort of health binge, and we look at them and say, I should do more. I understand on a level that, you know, if I want to be able to handle a lot of different things and bounce back from things, I want to be in good physical health. So I should be exercising. We know really at a gut level that if we're making good food choices and eating healthy, it's going to affect our ability to work hard, work longer hours, you know, sleep better. We want to remember our vitamins and we want to remember to be able to sleep. So we kind of already know this at an intuitive sort of gut level of what we need to be doing to handle things that come our way. And we've seen that very much with this COVID crisis that people um, who are less healthy, tend to be a little more fragile, tend to sort of um, get knocked out a little bit faster with this. And that's something that we've, we've understood as a society, despite the fact we have that contrary information that our diet's not always perfect and that we make some bad food choices and, and people with underlying medical conditions are gonna be more susceptible. So I like to just present that because we understand it as a group that are, you know, if we have underlying conditions, it means that our body has less physical resources or reserves to fight off the virus. Um, what we don't talk enough about is that it's the exact same with mental health. People who are coming into this crisis already with a high level of stress, a high level of um, sort of burdens and worries and things that they've got on their plate, uh, who have maybe underlying conditions, already have depression, anxiety, they're gonna have less resources or reserves to fight off the stress or anxiety of, of this crisis. And I wish that we did treat mental health the same way we treat physical health because they're very much interrelated and it's very artificial to try and separate those two things. So I'd like to couch, when I talk about mental health, couch it in terms of the physical, the structural, because then I find I get more buy-in where people say, all right, it's not just some touchy-feely, let's meditate and give everyone a hug kind of talk. 
let's really go down to the science to talk about what's happening with our body and that feedback loop with our brain and our heart and all of the things that we're, we're worrying about that we need to make our mental health a priority because mental health, it either um, impairs our physical ability or it enhances it, but they're, they're absolutely related. And we just tend to, as a society, not wanna talk about mental health until we hit the wall, until we hit crisis level. And that's not doing us the best service for keeping ourselves and our workforce healthy. One of my um, one of the colleagues that I have in Canada who does research and, and work on compassion fatigue and burnout, she made this graph, and I just thought it was such a great way to sort of present the fact that once this hit, once people started having to change their behavior, either change um, if you may still be going to work, but you don't have your normal after work activities or your family members, you can't see them as much or they're feeling a lot of stress. We are as an entire planet going through this massive chronic extended mental health challenge, which is COVID. And a lot of people when they started working from home or changed their patterns of behavior thought, well, I'm gonna learn a new skill and pick up a new hobby and I've got all this time with my kids and my, I'm just, you know, life is rosy and I've never had this much time at home they're starting to be really hard on themselves by saying, well, why am I not doing more? Why do I feel so ineffectual? Why, when I get home, am I just sort of zapped in my strength and have no ability to, to think? And it's because when COVID hit, we already had all the things that were bouncing around in terms of what we were trying to handle in our brains and our emotions and, and things we had to deal with. So our pre-existing worry, fear, uncertainty, all of these things, they did not go away with COVID and they continue to take up the majority of our brain. But we also asked our brain to try and understand this huge crisis that has hit us. So that the yellow slice of the pie, this idea of having to cope. Every time we sit down and watch the news and try and understand the changes and recommendations, the politicizing of masks, the protests and, and all the stuff that's going on, that is adding to our worry, fear, uncertainty, confusion. So what's available left in our brain in terms of starting new projects or handling things in the same way we used to handle them, our optimism and our energy, it's really a small slice of the pie. So we're not quite ourselves right now. We're having trouble focusing. We're having trouble concentrating at home or at work. We have trouble staying on point. And most of us have trouble staying upbeat because this is a difficult and confusing and um, a marathon type of a mental health crisis. And we see a little bit of snippets in the news talking about upcoming mental health crisis, but for those of us who work on compassion fatigue, we're, we're worried, honestly, because the longer this goes, the more tired and the more sort of burnt out everybody is gonna get. And so we need to jump in and talk about boosting our mental health now rather than when this is over. So really that's my goal of presenting this sort of scientific information today about mental health, is I want everybody to take a look at what do they have going on? Um, how are they handling things? If you're not handling things as well as you think you are, what are the ways that we can sort of improve our, our mental health as well? So we're gonna go through strategies because this is a difficult time. Nobody is operating at 100%. Nobody is really able to balance and juggle it all. So the most important thing we can do is to just be kind to ourselves and say, all right, let's figure out why this is happening the way it is. So really a lot of our mental health responses in terms of stress are tied to our fight or flight reaction. So it is physiological, it's our body. And that's really adaptive. In the old days when there was a lion sitting in the bushes, even if we hadn't spotted it yet, we'd get that sense. We'd have sort of, you know, the hair on the back of your neck would stand up, our heart rate would start to increase and we would have this message. Our body would be taking in this external stimuli saying, something's not right, something's going on, I've got this sort of spider sense or I've got this feeling that something is off. And that was an important message because it, it put our body into this response readiness. The trouble is our, our dangers now aren't lions and bush, lions or tigers or bears and bushes, it's something more vague and it is the stress of work, the stress of our enjoyment of work, the stress of worrying about other people. A lot of things that we can't change and we can't run away from, puts us into fight or flight. So fight or flight really is adaptive when our body switches on this sort of readiness to go. So our sympathetic system kicks in. And what that means is that, you know, our, our lungs will expand so that we can get more air to be ready to, to flee. Our blood will go to our major muscles. Our pupils will dilate so we can take in more stimuli and information. 
uh, we just turn on a lot of systems that allow us to get ready to do that sort of activity, to be ready to, to work. The flip side is when we're in fight or flight, our body turns off the systems that we don't need as much. So it'll turn off digestion because we can digest our lunch later when we're safe. And it'll turn off our healing and it'll turn off our reproduction. And that's fine if we just go into fight or flight and then get out of it and become relaxed. The trouble is in our society now, we're in fight or flight all the time, which means that we're not giving our body that time to recharge. We're not giving our body that time to reset. And that's where we really fail. Because if we are 100% stressed at work and 80% stressed at home and 75% stressed watching the news, we're never getting into that healing, regenerative um, time that we need to be able to handle when our heart is pumping and our oxygen is going in that fight or flight system. So people say stress, well, it's just in your mind. There's nothing you can do about it. Why are you worrying about it? It is actually affecting us at the sort of neurochemical level. It's affecting our you know, adrenaline that's being kicked in. It really is something that is having a physiological strong response on our body. So the only way that we can counter that is by being aware of it and thinking about how we can change our state. So there's a couple of sort of important structures that really kick in when we're in that sort of stress mode. And this is sort of what I see with the kids that I work with who've been, you know, stressed for a long time in terms of having been through child abuse or human trafficking, their biological structures will change with ex increased exposure to stress. And I tell you that because when we're working as adults, we're in the same thing where a lot of stress at work or a lot of stress in other places are going to actually change our structure and change the way we react to things. So the amygdala is part of the sort of basic interior parts of the brain, and it's the alarm system. And that's the thing that goes off when we've got that danger symbol and it, it, it tells us that we need to go into fight or flight. But if you're stressed a lot, if you've been stressed a lot as a child or you're going through a lot of difficult situations, the more we turn on that alarm, the stronger it becomes and the more it will react. So some people who live a very comfortable Zen life, maybe you know something will happen and they'll see it as a, a minor thing. But for people who are already under a lot of stress, that turning that alarm on, it goes on faster, it goes on louder, and it brings all of those other systems along with it when it's triggered. So I like the image here where, you know, one person can hear a ringing and they'll think of it as something positive, like an ice cream truck, whereas the other person finds it cacophonous or disruptive, destructive because they're associating it with all of the other times their stress is turned on. And that's something that we can't control. That's a biological level when people are um, just they've become wired to react a lot stronger. So this is another image from addiction research where it's just sort of, you know, people who've already got a lot of stress, the littlest bit extra that is added to them, their systems are going, all of a sudden it, it just hijacks the rest of their brain and the rest of their response. So if you feel like you're reacting in an extreme way or you're reacting in a different way than you normally are, it is that fact that this extra stress has sort of got the foot on the on button all the time for us being worried and, and anxious. We'll talk more about that. The other structure that really plays in in terms of uh, work performance when we're under a lot of stress is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is a part of the brain that very much it's, some people call it sort of the file retrieval part of the brain. It's where our brain sort of stores and retrieves memory, but it also helps us regulate emotions. So. Um, when a lot of us that work in the stress field teach children, we talk about the hippo, think of that, the hippocampus as being the hippo. When the alarm is going off, the hippo will hide under the desk. It just it displaces our ability to retrieve memories, to store memories, and it, it interferes with the way we react, react to things. So we see a lot of hippocampus damage uh, in veterans who've been away and been under a lot of stress. The good news is, though, even though we can see the physical structural change that a lot of stress will have on the hippocampus, we also know that treatment like meditation and yoga can actually heal the structures, the hippocampus, and get us back to our sort of better processing. But I just wanted to give you this information because if you're at work and you find that you're forgetting things or you're not reacting the way you normally do or you can't, you know, you're not as sharp as you normally think you are, that is your stress overriding the sort of normal operation of your brain. 
So with the brain, what we see in extremely stressful times is that it, it makes sense that the brain is going to sort of move us to our reactionary, more basic responses, the fight or flight response. Your entire body is ready to run or do something. So what our brain does is it has certain pathways between the alarm system and the, the hippocampus, and that's a very strong connection. The blood flows, and we know that the littlest thing will right away put us into that ready to move, ready to go action stage. But what it actually does is that when we're in this stress, it drains the blood from our, our outer frontal cortex. So we're not going to have that higher level of reasoning where, you know, our body says it's a time for action, not for thinking. Let's either run, let's not analyze what's going on, let's just do something. And that's good if we really are running, but when we're in this extended period of stress where we have to continue to work, where we have to continue to make decisions, but our body is trying to get that fight or flight, we're just not reacting the way we used to in terms of that, that sort of structure of thinking. So it's going to interfere with our ability to handle stress, um, reason through why someone's making a certain comment, you know, be objective if you get criticism at work. All of these things that we normally rely on our frontal cortex to take that higher level reasoning road, it's being physically depleted because we're in this fight or flight situation. And our body doesn't want us thinking and analyzing and and uh, sort of mulling things over, it wants us to react. So we need to understand that stress is really hijacking our, our brain and our responses. And we could physically see that in terms of blood flow, which is, is kind of amazing. There we are. So the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is an awesome system that gets us ready to deal with difficult situations, it's partly the neurochemical in terms of releasing stress hormones and the immediate sort of reactions and pathways, but it also brings into play our, um, our hormones in different levels as well. And that's good. If we're in an emergency situation and our adrenal glands start producing the things that we need to get us to run, to minimize the pain that we feel, makes us more awake, gets all the other organs that we need in place to produce oxygen and blood and be able to do that sort of emergency situation, that's great if it's a short-term response. We wanna be able to run, and um, there's a really good book in the stress area about why do zebras um, not get ulcers. I mean, animals in the wild, they'll have that moment of sprinting, and as soon as the danger is gone, they're back to chewing the grass and looking at the blue sky, and they've forgotten it. In humans, when we have our emergency crisis situation, we may physically be out of danger, but our mind keeps that danger alive and that stress keeps going and we always feel like we're never safe. That is something that's gonna short out our bodies because we're producing all of these things that are meant to be short-term responses. So if you're in a constant state of readiness, it's going to be exhausting. It's gonna be pumping out these stress hormones, which produce more stress hormones. We have all of these different um, neurochemical reactions going on and being in that constant state of, of readiness and activity is anxiety. That's really how it's manifesting. So we've seen that a lot of people who are already anxious since COVID hit have become more anxious. People who weren't anxious are reporting being anxious because we're trying to interpret the messages that are flooding our body. We're in danger, something's off, something's wrong. And because it's not something we can fix, because it's not something that's changing very quickly, we're sort of left to interpret this with sort of this sense of anxiety. And that is important to understand because when you have that moment of doubt or dread or you're feeling overwhelmed, to be able to say, okay, this is my body in fight or flight. I can't fight this. I can't really flee right now. I'm not actually in immediate mortal danger. Just being able to understand why your body is sending all these signals to you is going to help you get out of that sort of spiral of stress. So COVID really is a tricky thing because it's not, um, uh, in the compassion fatigue area, we keep saying this is a marathon, not a sprint. It's so different than a lot of the stresses that we've had before. Um, here in Las Vegas, we really had a heavy lift after we had our mass shooting because we had a lot of people that were involved, um, a lot of responders that were involved, and we all sort of got together. We were able to grieve together. We were able to do memorials. We were able to figure out ways to, to sort of move on together. But it was, it was horrific, um, but it was over. Once the shooting was over, the healing started. 
COVID is so different because the crisis isn't over. This threat is still changing and building and morphing. And um, one person that I work with described it really well. It's sort of like having that fire alarm that's going off all the time. You know how sometimes you'll have a, a smoke detector that beeps intermittently and it just drives you nuts, but you get used to it and you sort of start ignoring it. And then as soon as the battery's replaced, you have silence, you've got that feeling of, oh, oh my gosh, okay, <laughs> this is what silence is supposed to be. COVID is that alarm that's going off in the background all the time. And we know that it's there and that we need to do something about it, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's undefined and ambiguous. I mean, medically, of course, we know how to manage the symptoms, but in terms of how long this will take, whether kids should go back to school, how dangerous is the risk, where is it moving across the US, that is a lot of stress that everybody is trying to juggle. And it's, it's stress that has so many layers as well, which is really different because, you know, at the one level we're thinking about our personal health, have we been exposed, um, you know, do we have the antibodies? That's, that's always something that, that takes over the brain when you're thinking about your personal health, but it's much more complex because we're wondering why the stock market's up and down, are people gonna have jobs, are our partners gonna have jobs? We have isolation, which is one of the most harmful things for mental health. The fact that we can't do our normal, normal social activities, we're isolated from our family members, we're choosing to stay away if we need to, or maybe it's extended friends. Then we've got the political squabbling, um, discrimination issues, protests, uh, and worldwide sorrow. I mean, really, when you turn on the news, we don't know which piece to look at. It's sort of overwhelming, but all of and any of those stories are enough to make us feel sad, to make us feel anxious. And when we know that there's a danger, on um, kicks our fight or flight, but we can't run because there's nowhere to go and the borders are closed. So we need to fight. So how do we fight something that we can't fight? And that's really where invoking the relaxation response is somewhere where we can actually try and override our body in terms of how we respond to stress. So the antidote to stress, the antidote to the sympathetic system is the parasympathetic system. And what we need to learn to do is to invoke our relaxed response, because that is if we're able to say, all right, I'm safe in this moment, um, I'm not in danger, I might have all this you know, information coming in that it's a dangerous time and there's things I can't fix, but if we can tell our body and override that stress response by breathing, by relaxing, um, and we'll talk about more strategies like mindful eating, then we're able to override that hijacking that our, our body and our brain has done that we're in danger and that we're in fight or flight. Now, it sounds like it's very simple, but it actually is something that requires a lot of practice. And the more that you do it, the better able you are to do it. So with this, um, one of the strategies I didn't include, but is, is certainly becoming popular is, is not watching news as much. Because we know that when we get information, so news about whatever the latest press conference or piece of information is, when we see that it's not gone away and it's still serious in the US, it releases our fight or flight hormones. So our, our mental processes trigger physiological responses. When we've got those physiological responses where we start to get worried or anxious, our, our body gets ready for fight or flight, our heart races, and then our, our brains go, well, what's happening? Why is my heart racing? And it becomes this sort of cycle of, it's a feedback loop between our mental processes, our physical reactions, and our physical reactions have to be interpreted in terms of what are our, you know, are we really in danger? That, that loop becomes faster and faster and faster the more that we get into it. The more we watch the news, the more we worry, the quicker we move into sort of our, our panic response, our fight or flight response. And we've always had in our lives before COVID things that stress us out. I mean, we have family members that stress us out or politics might have stressed us out before, but we didn't have as much stress in all the different places. And if we're doing well in terms of our job or family or education or other areas, we could bounce back from the things that stressed us out. So we might start to get this piece of information that you know something bad is happening, but we could recharge or re-energize by focusing on the things that we enjoy, our vacations, our holidays, things that are now being canceled. So we have to remember that because we have this inability to sort of escape the stress of, of COVID, it's like we're compressed. We're not reacting the way we normally did. And we've seen this with the lockdown where a lot of people are spending more time with their parents or their spouses than they normally do. 
and it's not going as well as people would have hoped. And that's because we have less coping skills where all these springs that have been compressed due to all the stress, so our ability to handle someone else's bad mood or handle um, bad grades from our kids or you know, our parents refusing to follow the rules and insisting on going out to parties, these things that normally we could handle, we don't have that, that sort of springing us an ability to bounce back the way we used to because of the stress that we're under. So with the relaxation response, with breathing, what it is is I can't take stress away from your lives, but I can teach people how they can interpret what the stress is. So when you're watching the news and you start to get anxious and your fight or flight hormones kick in and your heart starts to race, you'll be able to say, okay, I'm sitting on my couch right now. It's um, Friday at six o'clock. I'm not in physical danger at this moment. I don't know what the future holds, but it's Friday and I'm safe in my house. Um, and you just sort of say, let me take a few deep breaths. Let me override the fact that my heart is racing. Let me take a moment to focus on gratitude or focus on something where I'm not in danger. You interrupt that cycle and your heart rate will start to slow down and you'll be able to get back all your mental um, faculties to be able to reason what it is that made you anxious. So that's why we wanna learn how to do this relaxation. We're gonna continue to be stressed and we're gonna be, continue to start these stress cycles. But if we're able to identify, okay, I'm spinning in a stress cycle right now, let me do some breathing or let me walk or let me pet my dog for a little while, that's going to be the, the tool that we need to interrupt it so that we don't keep spinning in that sort of circle. So what are strategies to help you deal with stress? One of the first ones is sleep. Um, being able to sleep is something that helps you recharge. It cleanses your brain. It cleanses your bodily systems. It really gives you the ability to handle things. If we aren't sleeping well, we're not as good at handling anxiety. Um, when you're sleepless, you just sort of overreact to things. Your body and your brain both react differently. But when we're anxious, it interferes with our ability to sleep. So a lot of people are in this vicious cycle where they know they need more sleep, but worrying about not getting enough sleep makes them anxious and they can't sleep. For me, sleep is the thing that I really lost as this um, pandemic hit. And it's something you can't, you know, saying I'm going to make myself go to sleep right now doesn't quite work. But one of my friends, Jody Samra, she has a great compassion recharge site. And she talks about sleep hygiene. There's some things that we can do to try and improve our quality of sleep because we know we've got all this anxiety weighing on us. So what can we do to try and counter that anxiety and improve our sleep? Because if you have any underlying psychological conditions, lack of sleep just exacerbates them. So in this time of fight or flight stress, we need to try and figure out how to sleep. So one thing that, that Dr. Zammer recommends is not to nap as it interferes with later sleep. Um, that's sort of age specific. If, if you're talking about um, seniors, you know, they, they nap all the time. But for um, average working age adults, you know, having a nap actually, particularly in the afternoon, will interfere with your ability to sleep later. Setting a regular wake up time for people who are working at home and anyone who's done shift work, it's sort of difficult if you don't have that regular schedule. Um, she recommends exposing yourself to natural light as soon as you wake up. So open the windows, take a second, look outside. Um, our bodies really are these mechanisms that we respond to visual stimuli and, and the sort of the, the sunshine really makes a difference. Limit your caffeine afternoon. A lot of us, because we're not sleeping and we're stressed, we're turning to coffee to keep us going through the rest of the day, but caffeine has a, a six hour half-life. So we're not going to sleep as well. Even though it helped us get through the afternoon, it's going to negatively affect us at night. Limiting your alcohol. Alcohol helps you fall asleep if you pass out, but it very much interferes with your quality of sleep. So um, limiting your alcohol, which is a coping strategy some people are using for stress, but it's going to interfere with the sleep. One thing um, a lot of people recommend is just have a pad by your bed and write down a list of worries. If you find that you're lying in bed and a lot of things are bouncing around in your head, if you write it down, it helps you move on to the next topic or the next thing to worry about, but it really does reduce your, your rumination. She also recommends that you don't watch TV or use your computer in bed. The bed should only be for snuggling and sleep. And that is uh, something that, our again, our body will associate stress with locations. And if you're watching the nightly news in bed, it's very hard for your body to sort of wind down and get to sleep. And keep your temperature cool also improves quality of sleep. So those are a few sleep tips. 
The second area that's important to remember is, is really to know that you're not going to be yourself right now. And kindness, we need to all be kind to ourselves. Because we're primed with this stress, because we're worried with all this lack of information, because we're juggling a lot of different things, we are not quite ourselves. You know, we overreact while driving, we um, underreact to people asking us for sympathy. We're just so busy trying to focus on staying afloat and staying upright. We don't have the same sort of breadth of ability to, to handle other people that we normally do. So it's okay to break down and cry. It's okay to cry in the shower. I mean, if you're a parent, you try not to cry in front of your kids, but it's sometimes we have to hit the wall and we have to let this all out. And that can be one of the most sort of healing therapeutic things that you can do. So be kind to yourself. Know that you're gonna be kind of snippy, kind of cranky, kind of different. And we all are because we're under this constant sort of um, stress of, of the COVID situation. We're primed to react because we're in fight or flight mode. So don't expect to be your normal calm, zen, patient self. And that's okay. Um, it, I mean, apologies go a long way. I'm Canadian, I apologize a lot. But you know, when we lose it with people that we didn't mean to lose it with saying, I'm sorry, that, I don't know what happened, that wasn't me, um, you know, I'll try better. That really, people will understand because everybody's primed to react because we're all dealing with this COVID stress. I wish strategy three is to really stay connected with people. And I wish that we'd called it physical distancing, not social distancing, because we need each other. We need that social connection. That is the sort of the, the most important part of our brain is knowing that we're not alone, that other people are seeing things the same way that we do. Social connection is how we heal. That is, I mean, that's what we normally do in grief situations. We get together as a group and we share stories and we talk about what we've lost and talk about where we're gonna to get to next. Because we can't do that physically, um, we need to find a way to do those social connections, but do them remotely. And if we don't, we're not gonna be dissipating the stress that we need to, to do. So calling friends or family, even if your friends and family are annoying, <laughs> if you've had a stressful day and you make the point to call someone else, it's gonna distract you from the things that you're worrying about. So. It really is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Um, set a Zoom call, there's Google Duo, phone dates, there's lots of different ways to do it. If you really can't handle talking to people, write a letter. If you just want to feel connected, sit down and write someone, maybe a thank you note and say, I remember our vacation two years ago and that was really amazing. And our brains will be able to be transported to that positive focus instead of sort of being mired in the, the stress situation. So when your sympathetic nervous system and the alarms are going off and you've got that heart rate increasing and the breath increasing and you know that you need to do something, physically calling someone and talking to them about meaningful things, talking to them about memories, talking to them about shared events will tell your body you're not in danger. It will override that sympathetic nervous system. And we, we don't do it because we're sort of agitated, we're stressed and, and we wanna just move on to the next thing. Um, but social connection is one of the most powerful things for our brain because we've got our, our reptilian brain, the internal brain is the one that keeps getting hijacked, having our alarm systems going off. The next level of our brain is our sort of um, satiation in terms of overeating and doing our comfort behaviors. That's okay to a certain extent, but it's gonna lead to extended problems in terms of health, both physical and mental. But our social connection, that's what makes us so uniquely human. And that's what tells us we're safe, we're okay, we're connected. So hug the monkey when you can. Go to your highest level, your, your outside brain, your cortex, to try and tell the, the agitated, sort of more basic parts of your brain that you're okay and you're gonna be fine. And animals in terms of connection can be as important as, as humans. And that research is kind of uh, amazing. I know that a lot of people are spending a lot more time with, with pets than they have before, but from psychological research, it shows that people with pets are more um, balanced, particularly if you have dogs, because dogs and other animals force us to be on a schedule. They, um, you know, no matter how funky we're feeling, they still have to be walked. They come and jump in our laps and say, time for dinner. Taking care of other beings and having that connection is really powerful. It gets us out of our own sort of mental ruts and ruminations. So um, 
my daughter is, is in Toronto. She's been trapped there and the borders are closed, but she, that's her dog and her bunny that she's with. So I do very much miss her. She's 23, but at least I know she's got her pets to take care of. And I know that that's going to keep her on a schedule and, and, and she'll have someone, something to snuggle with when she's, you know, feeling a bit lonely and isolated. So animals, a lot of people have been going to shelters and adopting pets. It really is one of the most powerful things that you can do. Um, and if you don't have a pet, maybe borrow your neighbor's pet or take another animal for a walk. It's just something that really, really gets us out of our, our sort of rumination mindset. And this, the final strategy I wanna to give to you is that we need to listen to our body. Um, we tend to focus on maybe aches and pains and we know when things are breaking down, but it's this constant interplay between our stress and our body sending messages. And if we ignore what it is that our body's saying, our brain's gonna interpret it differently. So we know with this COVID crisis that we can't fix, that we don't know quite how to handle, we've got that alarm bell going off saying, do something, do anything. And the best thing you can do when you're stressed is to move because you're, you're, if we're ignoring that alarm system, all of that tension and all of those sort of um, chemical levels are going to keep building and keep building with the stress hormones. And it's very easy to release that. Um, walking up and down stairs is one of the best ways to sort of release that stress response. When I work with the 911 dispatchers, every time they have a bad call, you know, they've taken in, their body has completely responded to that, you know, being on the line with someone who's in crisis, who's, you know, in this life or death situation, that doesn't immediately dissipate when the call is over. So they'll, um, we talk about just going up and down the stairs a couple of times to sort of release your arms, release your legs and say, okay, I'm not physically in danger anymore. That person's probably being helped. And so that you're ready and resourced to help the next person. So yoga, we know that yoga is a really good one for stretching and just sort of um, letting a lot of your thoughts go. Trauma recovery yoga here um, in Las Vegas is great because it really is a lot of guided meditation. Not everybody likes yoga. If your mind's going too furiously and you've got a history of trauma, it may feel unsafe to just be left with your mind, but YouTube and, and lots of public venues have a lot of these guided meditations or guided, yo guided yoga where you can really see where you're holding your stress, see what your aches and pains are. Meditation is, again, with the guided meditation, you can find a lot of that online. It's just this ability of trying to focus on your breathing and slow your thinking so that you get back into that, that um, your relaxed response. And when you're doing anything, I mean, your exercise may not be this, it might be um, just walking around the neighborhood or going for a bike ride or um, juggling a ball. Anything that you're doing, is gonna help you because when you're doing something mindful, if you're coloring or knitting or doing any kind of hobby, when you're forcing your body and your hands and your vision to work together to concentrate, you're gonna displace the anxiety. You're taking a break from the worries and the anxiety and that reduces your stress hormones. It reduces your cortisol, it'll release endorphins, um, particularly if you're doing a lot of cardio, um, the painkillers kick in because you've run too far or your body's sort of, you know, trying to adjust to the athleticism, but that's an antidote to stress. So any kind of movement, any kind of concentrated activity, even if it's minor, it's going to fight your anxiety at the neurochemical level. You're taking back your body in that stress response. So five minute dance party is one of the ones that I love and I make my students do, but we're at the end of the talk here. I won't make people dance, but the Center for Mind-Body Medicine talks about that mind-body connection and they work with trauma victims in war-torn areas. And they'll get these kids who've just had their lives totally upended, get up and dance for five minutes and dance like you're three years old with your arms flailing and your legs going and like nobody's watching. That is one of the most amazing ways to interrupt that stress response and reduce your cortisol. So whether you're trying to meditate, not doing it perfectly, or you're just going to dance around your room, that's one of the most powerful things you can do to tell your body, it's okay, I'm safe, and I'm able to handle this stress. So thank you. I know I talk very quickly, uh, but we've got a time to do some questions. And I hope that uh, science-y information will help. That was terrific, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you so very much for your insightful words. I know that um, the, as a group that we have on the call here, so many of the people probably recognize a lot of their own responses within that and, and can definitely use some of this information. So again, I will reach out to the people on the line here. If you could please um, drop your questions for Dr. Kennedy into the question box on the right side of your screen. We want to get to those. 
Uh, we also will take and respond via email any questions you have about the guidance that have come out in the last week or uh, other questions that you have that you would like the Disaster Preparedness Program team to respond to. And then Courtney, I know you're online to help us with questions. If you um, can let us know if we have any coming in, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it looks like we have one comment um, from a listener who I think we all kind of, um, you know, can identify with on the long hours that our, our SNF providers have been putting in. So I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, due to all the issues with everything going on, there is no escape from stress. We find ourselves working anywhere between 12 to 14 hours, then dealing with the families, uh, residents, employees, and agents, uh, agencies. It is really difficult to relax. And Dr. Kennedy, do you have any tips for anyone who might be listening who really struggles with carving time out to... Um, you know, f do some of these strategies that you that you shared with us today? Yeah, I think it's important to try and explain to people when you need to take time for yourself that it's about your your physical and mental health together because helpers in particular, we're so good at taking ev care of everyone else and we never take care of ourselves. But the reality is we can only run at 100 miles an hour before we collapse. So we may be leaving it all at work, um, but we we have to find ways to ask for help or reduce the load that we have, or to sort of say, you know, for me to be able to continue to help others, I have to help myself. And that means I'm gonna build in a walk by myself or a phone call with someone else, or I need to sleep in another room and um, have, you know, three nights of uninterrupted sleep. Just find ways to recharge, because if you don't sort of Put your foot down and say this is the break i need or this is what i need to be able to keep going we collapse we just go until we collapse and that's not um that's not then then everybody is sort of let down but we're very good at you know meeting everyone else's needs and we forget to schedule ourselves in i Thank think you. that um caregivers are probably the worst um people in regards to listening and taking their own medicine um just as you said caregivers definitely are um don't take this this advice very well so we need and our, our residents out there need all of us not only for ourselves but to, to pass along to our staff um, to share some of this information so that way we are still going to be functioning in the long haul because we know that this isn't going to be resolved even in the next few months so definitely um, take take this hard medicine and and try and carve out that time that dr kennedy is speaking of we need you our residents need you so um, please be sure to share it all right courtney anything else um I would just like to let everyone know that the presentation will be sent out afterwards um, to the attendees. So thank you for, for that question. Um, we have one more here that could be directed at Dr. Kennedy while we have uh, her on the line. Um, someone is asking, what advice do you have for new parents where good sleep is wishful thinking? <laughs> hmm. That's a tricky one because um, babies do tend to interrupt our sleep patterns. When my kids were little, I, I had two mottos. One was this too shall pass. And the other one was five years from now, I'm gonna look back on this and laugh. <laughs> so um, it's, it's physically demanding and it's difficult now because we don't have our same sort of support group and system um, available. To, to sort of give us a break or spell us off because we're all trying to socially distance. Um, gosh, I guess it's just to try and let go of as many other things as you can so that when you do have a moment to sleep, you just sleep. Let go of worrying about the rest of the things and make sure that sleep is, is your number one priority ahead of clean house and everything else. Thank you. Dr. Kennedy, I'm going to jump in again. This is Deanne, and and I think one of the things that that I heard you say, and that I also read somewhere else, more towards the beginning of all this, was 
to kind of welcome in the day to, to just when you wake up to just kind of open the windows and let the sun in and, and feel it. Now, some people may be heading off to work before the sun is up. Um, but how does that help our, our response to the day? How does that make us feel more positive? Well, anytime that we sort of pause and we take in, we're very good at noticing the negative. It's sort of adaptive to be looking for dangers and, and um, you know, things that might hurt us or harm us. We're not as good at noticing the positive. So positive psychology is us taking a moment to notice our view or notice something that we're grateful for or we enjoy. Because in that moment, while we're concentrating on something positive, our brains aren't full of all the worries. So we just displace the anxiety and things we can't control by taking that moment and focusing on something we enjoy. So it could be that you love your first coffee of the morning and just to take a minute where you don't talk to anyone, you just enjoy the first five sips, you savor the flavor, you think about how far you can feel it go down your throat before you stop feeling it, you know, maybe you smell it. Anytime that your brain is focused on something positive and safe, you're in your re relaxation mode and you've displaced the fight or flight. But when we're stressed, we tend to eat on the fly and not take care of ourselves and fit a lot of different things in because we stay busy and that's not allowing us to get out of our fight or flight mode. So starting the day looking at the sunshine is just sort of telling your body, this is a change of state. I just am coming out of sleep. I've got more resources than I did when I went to bed. And you can just start in a sort of positive frame of mind. Terrific. So then um, just our audience, I'm going to assume that the majority of them are the leaders in their nursing homes. Um, we might have some other staff on here too. Hopefully it was shared with other people. But can you, just in the last couple of minutes that we have with you, talk a little bit about what key things you would say to those individuals who are leading the nursing homes? What should they either do or say? How do they keep inspiring as a cheerleader their team? Um, and how do they get them to kind of really soak into taking care of themselves so they too can continue? So how do our leaders help the um, people at the facility who are, are working in this situation daily? What should they take back? Well, I think the first thing is just acknowledging that everybody is, is in an unusual situation with a higher level of stress than ever before and that we need to sort of be patient. And even leaders need to admit when they're feeling overwhelmed or that, you know, that they're the ups and downs are, are happening. So knowing that we're all sort of carrying this heavy weight and going through difficult times, we want to try and build in a bit of positive, build in breaks, build in debriefing situations, build in um, just something that takes us away from the news and, and the difficult situations is going to help us all be more resourced and be more supported. And leaders have to make sure that people get some time off, including the leaders, um, because if our leaders burn out, that's we're not gonna have the support system that we need to, to keep all uh, everybody that's working really hard in place and, and supported. It's, it's a difficult time. We're all rolling up our sleeves and doing a lot of work, but we can pat each other on the back and remember, highlight the good things. Um, remember why you got into the job and why you you know, the people that you've helped, like we could help 10 people in a day and it's the one thing that goes wrong that we spend our time thinking about. We need to, to turn our mind to the 10 things that went right, the thank yous, the smiles, the good things. It's just, we're not wired that way. We tend to focus on the negative and what we need to change. Excellent advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. Okay, Courtney, I'll just check with you one more time. Do we have any other questions? We have one more question. Um, it is related to infection prevention. So uh, would you like to hear it or shall I follow up afterwards? Uh, well, if we, we do have a couple minutes left, so hopefully we have the right answer. So if you want to go ahead and pose it, that would be great. Okay. Um, the question is, is it okay for the director of nursing to be designated as the infection preventionist? Oh, yeah, well, um, the Department of Public Health does not accept your director of nurses as the infection preventionist. And, and the, the biggest part of that is that your director of nurses is expected to be working full time at being a director of nurses and would definitely be pulled away from infection prevention responsibilities. Now, of course, our director of nurses uh, do point out, see things that are 
infection prevention related, but they actually want someone who can focus their full effort on that. And so, no. Um, I know some people have said, well, if I don't have anyone else, um, you know, there is the potential and you could work through your district office with your mitigation plan if you're a smaller place and that individual that's your director of nurses is going to pick up extra hours to say an extra eight hours during the week and on top of the director of nurses position so that way you can fulfill the minimum of a full time say they're picking up one eight hour shift to make it a full time ip then that that would be a little bit different story but definitely work with your district office if that is the case but in general they are not going to say it's okay for the director of nurses to fulfill that position Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Okay. All right, great. Courtney, anything else? Um, just a quick note on the CEs. Uh, continuing education will be available online um, on CAF.org if you register through the CAF.org website. And this video will be available for replay on the QAF uh, Learning Management System. Um, just give it a, a few, a couple days. And then we post these to YouTube as well. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, for uh, sharing these strategies with us and uh, for your time today. And thank you. Uh, Deanne as well, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And Courtney, what is the, so everybody on this, we've got at least 200 people here. So we just want to say, make sure that you go to the CAF YouTube channel and you, you know, I feel like a YouTuber, smash that button, um, put the like on there, follow, um, ring the bell, whatever <laughs> like it is. Like and subscribe, um, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe, there you go. I was looking for the right term, thanks, Courtney. You know, so that way we have more followers. You can, you know, sign up for notifications so you know when the new ones are coming out. Um, we are going to be sharing some very interesting stories about skilled nursing on there. Some of you are participating in those interviews. Um, the more people we have, so recommend it to your staff, recommend it to everybody you know, so that way we can get the skilled nursing story out, the one that is real, that we experience every day and not what the media is saying. So I'm just going to plug that right now. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, Courtney. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Can't just say how much we really appreciate you being on here and bringing this information to um, our membership and all those out there who are uh, just a little bit under stress. And uh, thank you again for joining us. We will be back here again next week. Jason will be back as your host. And uh, thank you and have a weekend. Find some time for yourself. Thanks everybody.